over to Premier Kenny. Premier Kenny. Well, thank you so much, Paul and everyone for the invitation, and I'm, I want to especially thank my ministers for having done the hard part. I just get to, to walk in. They took all the tough questions, but I want to, first of all, begin by congratulating uh, every one of you for your election and re-election that uh, you just went through. Thank you for your public service. Uh, I know it's uh, never easy to put your name on a ballot, and local government is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, you, you folks are in touch with your uh, communities in a real and t tangible way every single day, uh, and that is the true spirit of public service. And I, I just want to underscore what our ministers were saying here and throughout the week, which is uh, our desire to, to listen to you, to collaborate, to cooperate, and to be Team Alberta. Uh, we have been through a couple of, well, a few really tough years as a province. Uh, you know, our economy still has not fully recovered its size and output from where it was back in 2014. Just think about that for a moment. Uh, our economy today is still smaller than it was five, six years ago. That has been a prolonged period of economic adversity. And of course, the last 20 months took that to a new level. We not only were faced with the biggest public health crisis since 1918, but the biggest collapse in the world economy since the 30s, and I, we had a double recession in Alberta because we had the biggest collapse of energy prices ever. And of course, that hits rural Alberta especially hard. So it has been, no, no point sugarcoating it, a time of real adversity. And you, you know that. You know the human impact of that. We see it in the opioid addiction crisis. We've seen it in the rural property crime wave. We've seen it in, in family breakups and, uh, and in so much adversity. You've seen it in your bottom line with the decline in your revenues in many municipalities just as we have. Alberta used to bring in $10 billion a year in, on average before 2015 in, in oil and gas revenues. Last year, we were projecting $200 million a revenue source down 98%, at least for a spell. So uh, th that is for real, the, the adversity through which our constituents have all gone. But the, new, but the positive message I want to convey to you today is that Alberta is back, it really is, and this province really is on a roll, right across the province. We've got a lot of big challenges we need to work together on, for sure, to repair the damage of the past 20 months and the last few years, but that is happening in exciting ways right across the province. And I, really, the most important message is one of collaboration. As you know, we have uh, Minister Nate Horner started out as Minister for Rural Economic Development and has now added agriculture and forestry to his responsibility. Nate has begun rural engagement sessions right across the province to listen, as have other ministers. It's been sometimes hard in COVID to get out and meet face to face but I believe we can do more of that in the months to come. Uh, and so please uh, take up the opportunity uh, to not just deal with Minister McIver, but, but all of the ministers responsible for areas that you're concerned about. Uh, let me talk about some of those things. First of all, uh, I know there are real concerns about uh, rural health care. Perennial issue, and it's an issue right across Canada. The recruitment and retention of uh, physicians and nurses, medical professionals in, uh, in rural areas has been a perennial challenge for, for decades, we know that. Which is why Alberta's government uh, last year put an additional $80 million into uh, rural physician recruitment and retention. And that's for about 750 rural physicians. So on average, more than $100,000 per. We actually do have more physicians working across the province today than at any point in our history. We are spending more on health care than on any, at any point in our history. I know you read headlines about health care cuts, but in fact the budget has gone from 19 to $21 billion. We've provided $3 billion in surge funding to cope with COVID. We added nearly a billion dollars to reduce surgical wait times last year. And our Minister of Health, Minister of Finance are working together to ensure that we have strong incentives for the recruitment and retention, not just of rural physicians, but also of nurses. We want to work with you to make sure we're responsive. I know there's a particular concern about EMS, and understandably so, because uh, when somebody gets really sick, they need that ambulance to be there for them, and that's, that's always going to be a, more ch a greater challenge in remote areas. 
It's been a particular challenge this year. I'm told that uh, EMS calls are up 30%. Uh, this, uh, that, that, that started this summer. A 30% increase, uh, which seems hard to understand, but I'm told that there's several factors. One, obviously, was the fourth wave of COVID, but also the big spike in opioid overdoses that we have sadly been experiencing, and just society returning to more normal levels of activity. Uh, those, now, we seem to see in October that those numbers starting to come down a bit. But, and we have added additional resources, $8.3 million added to EMS back in August. We now have uh, 2,900 EMS staff compared to 2,600 back in 2019. So staff is up by 9%. And it, it, in the past year, they've hired hundred, uh, hundreds of new staff, keeping the vacancies at the same level. But more needs to be done clearly because service times are not acceptable in many rural communities. We hear that message loud and clear, and I know that Minister Copping is working uh, with his rural colleagues to address that. I also want to take on, I know that many of you are concerned about uh, the issue of provincial policing, the concept of an Alberta Provincial Police Service. So, uh, you know, this is a concept that's been in discussion for many years in our province. And uh, Alberta used to have its own Provincial Police Service before the Depression. Newfoundland and Labrador, Quebec and Ontario do, and I can tell you, I know of at least a couple of other provinces that are giving it a serious look. Major municipalities like the city of Surrey in British Columbia, 650,000 people uh, just went to their own municipal police service. Why? Because more and more, I think there's a recognition of the value of community policing. We value, honor, and respect the professionalism of the RCMP and the way they've served our communities uh, for the better part of a century. Uh, and uh, we don't want to undo what's good about policing in Alberta. But at the same time, we got to recognize that the RCMP has multiple complex mandates across the country and a workforce that comes from across the country, which leads to a constant rotation of staff in and out of our communities. I believe that we should at least look at the possible benefits of rural Alberta experiencing the same kind of local community policing that Edmonton and Calgary uh, and, uh, and, other, uh, sm uh, and some of the mid-sized cities have in Alberta. Because I, I think there's something in a, a service where a young person growing up in Wetaskiwin or in Westlock could dream of going to a police academy, coming back and serving the community that they grew up in for the rest of their lives. A community where they know people where they know who maybe some of the bad guys are, where they know the geography, they know the local customs, they know how best to serve their community. That's the idea of community policing, and it works, rather than a constant rotation of staff in and out from across the country. But I encourage you, I know that, there, that the union that is increasing uh, policing costs significantly in Alberta is out there spending millions of dollars in, a, in an interest campaign. That's their right. But I encourage you not just to look at what the union has to say, but to actually read the report developed by the Department of Justice and Solicitor General, which paints a very interesting picture of a community policing model in Alberta with governance from Albertans, a police commission that would include, for the first time ever, permanent representation for Indigenous people on police governance to help us to address some of the difficult, tackle some of the difficult issues around, let's face it, racism and the imperative of reconciliation. It would also integrate, and this is something I, I, I would encourage my friends from right across the political spectrum to look at, integrate wraparound social services, uh, accessing psychologists and social workers and child uh, uh, welfare workers into the policing system to provide uh, uh, services where appropriate, including, for example, through the alternative drug sentencing courts that we've set up. So I think it's a, it's a model that's definitely at least worth, worth looking at. But I want you to know this. We won't make any changes without careful cons consultation with municipalities because it affects you so much, and more broadly with Albertans. And if we, had, uh, if we propose any model, any incremental cost would be adopted exclusively by the province and not by municipalities. That's our commitment to you. Um, I also want to take on issues about... Uh, uh, well, let me, let me switch to, I think, the great good news that's happening in Alberta right now, which is our economic recovery. Uh, Alberta is now leading Canada in economic growth. 
We are projected to see an expansion of our economy of 65 to 7% this year. We are projected by pretty much all of the economists to be leading Canada in growth again next year. We are second only to British Columbia in job growth. We've seen 90,000 net new jobs created in Alberta since the beginning of this year, 65,000 uh, in the past three months alone. Last month, Stats Can reported a decline of nearly half a percent in the unemployment rate in Alberta. And uh, that's, that's impressive and exciting news. But underneath it is something that is, uh, I think, a, a real mo inflection point in Alberta's economic history right now. Now, some might say, well, this is just because commodity prices are back. And that sure does help. By the way, to all of those who have spent their time lobbying to, to shut down the oil and gas industry, to landlock Alberta energy against pipelines, to the David Suzuki's of the world who seem to be rationalizing uh, eco-terrorism and violence, uh, to all of those voices, what we see now in the global economy is a scarcity of the kind of energy that we produce here in Alberta. As prices go up, that's why prices are increasing, and durably so. We have billions of people in the developing world living in energy poverty, and increasingly, hundreds of millions of people in places like Europe who may be challenged by energy poverty as well. And more and more, those who have been campaigning against the kind of energy we responsibly develop understand that they actually need it, Amongst them, President Biden, who cancelled the Keystone XL pipeline, but is now begging the OPEC dictatorships to produce and ship more energy. You can hardly make this up. Keystone would have shipped 840,000 barrels a day of Alberta Heavy to U.S. refineries. They killed that in its tracks, and I'm sorry, that, that, that shut, shut down a lot of jobs building that pipeline in rural Alberta. And now the U.S. is importing exactly that quantity of oil, 840,000 barrels a day from Vladimir Putin's Russia. And a lot of that money is used to spread conflict and violence around the world. It doesn't make any sense. But this recovery in, pro in prices, I think, reaffirms what we Albertans have always known, that the world does need our energy. And we must, uh, of course, rise to the environmental challenge as we are doing. But the growth that we are experiencing is not primarily because of that price recovery. It has not yet turned into significant new capital investment or employment. Every time I talk to the uh, oil and gas CEOs, I remind them that we expect to see this, this cash flow, first of all, turned into uh, fairly compensating their employees and contractors, many of whom in your areas have taken huge haircuts in the past five years. But secondly, we want to see it turned into capital investment and new jobs. And they assure me that will be happening in a big way in 2022. But we are also experiencing, I, I think, the mo one of the most exciting periods of diversification of Alberta's economy that we've ever seen, right across the board. Uh, now, agriculture, of course, had a tough year in uh, this year uh, with some bad weather in many areas. And, and so yields were down and, and there were some pretty scary moments for livestock producers. I know a lot of, a lot of the herd had to, had to get uh, sold off. We were there to support our livestock producers uh, and, of course, uh, through crop insurance or farmers. But we are seeing some incredibly exciting things happening with huge new investments in food processing, in agri-tech, uh, right across the economy. In fact, we are working on, uh, there have been major announcements already, but another billion dollars in likely investments in the sector to help us add value to the food that our farmers and ranchers produce. Uh, and a huge new incoming investments in agri-tech that I think will make Alberta a world leader. Of course, one area we are really putting the pedal to the metal is in irrigation, with uh, having assembled a $930 million package for the first major renewal of Alberta's irrigation infrastructure in six decades. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to the 10 local irrigation districts, I know some of whom are represented here today, uh, for being partners with us in that. We just announced an expansion of that. It was uh, uh, 800 million announced la a year ago. We added 130 million in our ambition just recently. And um, this is going to help us to increase the amount of arable land in Alberta by 230,000 acres while improving yields. Nate and I were on a farm east of Calgary recently where his, he just installed new pivots because of this program 
and managed to get 100 bushels an acre on his wheat, uh, whereas neighbors without the irrigation were getting 25 bushels an acre. This is a change maker that will save and sustain many farms across rural Alberta, making them more productive and helping rural communities thrive. That's a big deal, and uh, we are totally committed to it. Of course, uh, we see an explosion in the Alberta high-tech, uh, digital, and innovation economy. This is the best year. Last year was the best year ever on record by far in venture capital, which is the jet fuel for those, largely those tech and innovation startup companies. And this year, we've doubled that number again. And uh, a, a critical part of that, you've seen major announcements being made uh, with global companies creating thousands of jobs in the province, most recently Amazon Web Services. Uh, announcing a $4.3 billion hard capital investment. This is not like soft consulting jobs. Th th this is when it's going to be a major global center for processing data for their cloud services. Puts Alberta clearly on the global map for IT. All of that's good news, but we need to make sure that that good news reaches every corner of the province. Because we know that high-speed internet holds the promise to connect rural communities to high quality services, be it education or healthcare, but also digital jobs. One thing that's coming out of COVID is a decentralization of where and how people work. I know some of your communities like, like Nanton are, 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 are benefiting from that as people move to, to live in more affordable communities. And so getting 100% high speed broadband internet coverage for rural and remote communities up and down the province is a key priority for this government. It's absolutely central to Alberta's recovery plan, which is why we've already invested $150 million in our capital plan. Uh, as you heard, I think, earlier t this morning from Minister Glubish, that's not, the begin that's not the end, that's just the beginning. To prime the pump, to maximize what we can get out of the feds, when I say get out of the feds, to maximize how much of our tax dollars we get back from Ottawa, and to leverage as much investment as we can from the private telcos. Now, I know that, my, uh, that the leader of the opposition was here yesterday talking about a bright, shiny commitment in this respect. They had four years to invest in rural broadband and invented, didn't invest one red cent in it. Uh, we are committed not just to putting Alberta tax dollars in this, but making sure that the companies that actually provide the service have skin in the game. Uh, and, and, and there is no one-size-fits-all approach to this. In some cases, it's going to be uh, 5G, wireless. In other cases, it's going to be a hard broadband infrastructure. Uh, there are many different solutions for different communities. We want to work with you. I want to give a shout out to, to um, Jim Wood from Red Deer County. He was the first municipal leader to really put this central on my radar screen as critical to the future of the rural economy. And we are absolutely committed to getting uh, your communities at the highest possible speed of access to the global digital economy uh, in the next few years as we roll this out. I also want to address, uh, you know, we're talking about this incredible diversification. We see it happening in uh, ent entirely, well, al almost new industries. One industry that really benefits rural Alberta is film and television. We're having our best year ever with the enhancement of the Alberta Film and Television Tax Credit, uh, we used to bring in about $150, $200 million of production value per year. This year, we're having a billion dollar year, about an, uh, about an eight-fold growth in the quantum of investment in film and television. I don't, I, I, uh, this, this weekend after my party AGM, I, I, I went with some friends to the IMAX to see uh, Ghostbusters which is a magnificent uh, uh, shooting and sh cinematography down in, of course, in, uh, down around uh, uh, Fort McLeod and in the Drumheller area. I, I strongly recommend. Number one film in the world today, shot in rural Alberta. The, the Last of Us, HBO's blockbuster, the largest film or television production in Canadian history. We estimate $600 million over three seasons, about six years being shot, again, primarily in rural Alberta. Uh, th th this is a game-changing industry, and companies like HBO tell us that they are here to stay. Uh, the recovery plan is also, of course, 
we've got, we're getting the economic fundamentals right with the job creation tax cut, the red tape reduction initiative. We've managed in, in just over two years to eliminate 120,000 Alberta government regulations, thanks in part to your input. That represents about 20% of the regulatory burden imposed by Alberta. And we've gone from an F to an A, from 10th to second place in the CFIB's red tape report card. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get an A plus. It will be uh, first out of 10 when they do their report this year. Uh, in fact, well, I, I, I have a little bit of a preview on that, so it's going to be good news. But I, I, please help us continue to, to accelerate that red tape reduction plan as we get the best, because our goal is to become the freest and fastest moving economy in North America. But in addition to those fundamentals, we recognize we needed to be competitive with other jurisdictions on critical new industries of the future, like petrochemicals, to add value to our natural gas feedstock. And so we uh, brought in the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program. And you've seen several multi-billion dollar announcements around that. Uh, it's not just that. That's part of our natural gas vision. It links into our hydrogen strategy. It's part of the investments Alberta's already made in carbon capture, utilization, and storage. It's also made possible by the uh, flexibility we've given municipalities to offer local property tax incentives and apply that to machinery and equipment. It's all, it also links up with our skills for jobs agenda to ensure that those companies have the workers they need to build those huge projects and to staff them permanently. Uh, and, and so much more. This is part of the broader strategy. But folks, it is yielding real dividends. Dow Chemical a month ago announced uh, th that they will be building the world's first uh, ethane cracker east of Edmonton in what will be the largest investment in the Alberta economy in, some, in about 15 years. Now, we're not able to publicly put the number, the dollar figure behind it because they have not yet got an FID from their board. But I can tell you, this is a massive game changer um, for the natural gas industry, as it'll be net zero, signaling again to the world our improving environmental performance. It'll produce products, that, as will the, the emerging hydrogen projects, that help the oil sands reduce their uh, emissions, while producing products that are in demand and diversifying our economy. Uh, Northern Petrochemicals, up in Greenview County, I want to salute Greenview for their leadership on the industrial zone that they've helped to create there to draw in investments like that, two and a half billion dollars, 4,000 upfront jobs, 400 permanent jobs for a net zero ammonia project that will help us to produce the product to carry the emerging hydrogen to global markets. We've seen five major hydrogen announcements and I can tell you that we are closing in on several more and several more potential petrochemical incentives. Uh, petrochemical projects, excuse me. These are huge industries, massive industry. Uh, and it, it, they also ensure a future for our, our natural gas sector. Because every additional unit of uh, feedstock that these hydrogen and pet chem plants are going to be buying requires upstream exploration and production, working for service companies all across rural Alberta. It is great and enduring news uh, for our economy. It links oil and gas with diversification and better environmental performance. It is a win, win, win. And uh, folks, not only in these areas, but diversity, we're we having the best year ever in forestry. And that, again, that doesn't happen by, uh, yes, prices have helped, but forestry investment next door in British Columbia is down. Why? because a government that keeps layering on more and more and more uh, regulations and red tape. Because uh, this province is open for business and reflected in our labor policies, our power policies, our regulatory policies. And, I, and so we are seeing capital shifting to modernize and expand uh, for, sawmills and forestry projects here in Alberta with our guarantee for access uh, to fiber. Uh, and so, uh, you, you, obviously, our economy continues to be affected by COVID, and no one has a crystal ball. We don't know where all of this is going to go. And we know, do know that the, uh, the tourism and travel industries continue to be hard hit. Uh, as a government, we've continued to advocate with Ottawa to have smart travel policies so that we can get back to safe uh, an increase in tourism, particularly for this upcoming uh, ski season, and I know that means so much in your communities. 
We've increased the budget for uh, tourism, or rather, Travel Alberta to better promote the Alberta tourism product. And we really want to partner with you and our First Nations on, in, in, on really upgrading the Indigenous tourism offering to be a key part of Alberta's future tourism industry. So in industry after, in, and you know, another key part of the recovery plan is huge capital investments. Now, we, last year was a, a, an 11, 12 billion dollar year, the biggest ever in building by the government of Alberta. Uh, the next, this and the subsequent two years will be $21 billion in our capital budget. Record high numbers again. And a lot of that flows through to you in municipal uh, capital grants. We, we know that, that there's going to be a future reduction in MSI. Folks, I just ask you to, to appreciate that this government came in and inherited a $9 billion deficit. That was unsustainable. We, we can't just continue to mortgage our future in that way. And we all know that we lived through the revenue roller coaster. We have to get our costs at least somewhere close to the national average. Um, with uh, what we've been through in the past five years, we could no longer afford the most expensive services in every area uh, across the country. And that's what the McKinnon panel told us, and they identified that one outlier in this province was a provincial uh, municipal infrastructure grants. But we're continuing what would be higher levels than almost any province. Uh, uh, in the in the long-term future and making of course many of our own critical investments irrigation and broadband being amongst them so the bottom line folks is that this province really is back in fact we think our biggest challenge next year and in in the foreseeable years is going to be coming back to where we were in uh, the early 2010s which is how do we find enough people uh, to take up the jobs that are available. We are developing a more focused workplace strategy, uh, people strategy, uh, that will be a centerpiece of uh, Travis's 2022 budget, and we invite your input into that. Some of the elements are uh, our, jobs, our skills for jobs agenda, uh, increasing the availability of apprenticeships and trades training and vocational training in our high schools, uh, building polytechnic collegiates that can uh, put a real emphasis on that practical, experiential, technical STEM learning in the secondary school system. Changing the funding formula for colleges and universities to focus on programs that have really good employment and labor market outcomes, as opposed to those that often lead to unemployment or underemployment. Uh, improving labor mobility across the country. We just passed uh, the Labor Mobility Act, which tells our professional regulatory bodies that they pretty much have to automatically certify credentials for people who move here from across the country. Because as I say, if you go to BC and you get sick, you don't ask to see if the doctor is a member of the Alberta College. You trust the Canadian standard. And so we need to cut that red tape that stops people from moving here or coming back uh, to Alberta. But a key part of this has to be a people strategy for rural. Because we know that, the, that one of the biggest challenges that many of you face has been population stagnation or decline. Keeping the young people in your communities. Maintaining the population so that the services can be offered for schools and, and, uh, and other critical services and amenities. That's a big part. Uh, and we know that these things are all connected. Rural health care and education connected to population. That's why we ran on a commitment to uh, radically reform Alberta's immigrant nominee program. That's where we get to select several thousand immigrants a year. Actually, when they come with their family, it's about 18, 20,000 a year. And we have said that we are going to put the overwhelming emphasis for that program going forward on rural communities. We have 1.4 million people in Calgary, 1.1 million in Greater Edmonton. We have enough people in the big cities. In many rural communities, we don't. And we want to use immigration as a tool to renew the pioneer spirit that brought people to our rural communities in the first place. And so uh, I really want to encourage you to look at the possibilities for being leaders in the rural renewal immigration program, uh, to, to bring hardworking entrepreneurial newcomers to your communities. So many of our rural communities have been incredibly hospitable. And when we saw in the 10, 15 years ago, a lot of those temporary foreign workers come here. So many of them transitioned into permanent residency and stayed 
in rural communities. We want to really amplify that. Uh, there are communities in Manitoba, places like Morden, that have doubled their population over the past 10 years, ago, or years or so with a very smart, proactive, and aggressive immigration attraction strategy. We want to partner with you, and this is something that Minister Chandrel and Minister Yassin are leading. Please, please help us help the renewal of our rural communities by attracting the entrepreneurs, the farmers, the workers of the future uh, to our rural communities. Folks, I, I just want to say again that this has been a challenging time for all of us, all of us in government, all Albertans. But never count out this province with its incredible resilience. Uh, and I truly believe what we have demonstrated over the past 20 difficult months is that our greatest asset, it's not our natural resources, our oil or our gas, it is our people, it is their entrepreneurial culture. Last, and I'll just leave you this one proof point if you're skeptical. Last year, 2020, when we were hit by that triple whammy and what I call the double recession, the collapse of energy prices, the COVID recession. Uh, we had a record number of Albertans go out and start new businesses, new business and corporations. It, can you imagine anywhere else in the, uh, in the planet where people's response to 25% unemployment and economic uh, devastation would be to go out and start a new business? And so many of those businesses are now thriving. That is Alberta. That is our culture. That is the Alberta advantage. And that is why this province is back and it's on a roll. Let's make sure that happens in a re very real way in our rural communities across the province. Thank you very much. God bless. God bless Alberta. Thank you. Thank you so much, Premier Kenny. I have to say that rural Alberta is open for business.